Hi everyone, my name is Bobby Collier and today is September 16th, 2016. And what I want to start doing in our Goodness of God teaching is I want to take a look at the name Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? Is it God? Is it Satan? Or is Yahweh a title? Because we know from our past teachings that clearly there are two voices that are coming through that same name. So either it's a title, and so whenever God speaks, it's assigned to that title. Whenever Satan speaks, it's assigned to that title. Or it's a name which belongs to one or the other, God or Satan. And unfortunately for one or the other, the other person's voice comes through that same name. So it's one of, it's one of those three scenarios. It's a title, it's God's name, which is being blasphemed by the devil, or it's Satan's name, and unfortunately our father's voice is getting tied to that same name. So it's one of those three scenarios. And so what we're going to do... We're going to do a multiple part teaching series on the name Yahweh and discover who it belongs to. And we're going to start this off by looking at the book of Exodus and specifically from right before the beginning of the Exodus until right after the Exodus. And that's an important period of time because Yahweh first introduced this name right before the Exodus to Moses. So that's when the, the name first comes alive. And so if we study that, then we can see what's going on here. So the first thing, is Yahweh a title? It could be that perhaps Yahweh is a title, and when Satan spoke, it was assigned to that title, and when God spoke, it was assigned to that title. After all, Yahweh was translated as the title Kyrios in the Greek New Testament, and later that was translated into English as the title Lord. Okay, but it was never translated as a name in the New Testament. Yahweh was always translated as Kyrios or Lord, but it was never translated as a name. So that seems to be some evidence that indicates perhaps it's a title. Also, we can look at the most modern translations have eliminated the name Yahweh from the Old Testament even, and they've replaced it with capital L-O-R-D instead of having the name Yahweh or Jehovah. I mean, there's still versions that are available like Modern King James, Literal Version, Holman Christian, and certainly there are others. But some of the more popular ones, like New King James and King James, um, NIV, they have uh, Lord, L-O-R-D, all capital letters. So maybe it's a title. Okay, if we look at this Greek word, Kyrios, in the New Testament, it's um, the Strong's reference G2962, and it's simply means somebody that's supreme in authority, a controller, by implication, mister, as a respectful title. It can mean God, Lord, Master, or Sir. Okay, so when you look at this definition, it's by no means a name. It's most definitely a title. So what's going to be important for us is how and when was the name Yahweh introduced? And if we look at Exodus 3.15, we see that this name was first introduced to Moses uh, in this passage right here. And it's just prior to the Exodus from Egypt. And this was a name that God wanted to be known and remembered by. Okay, so the name is it's important to know that this name first came on the scene in Exodus 3.15. This is after all the history of the book of Genesis had already taken place. So it's important to know that when Moses went back and wrote Genesis and all, all of his later writings as well, he did so with whatever understanding he had of God and his name based upon this meeting of him in Exodus 3.15. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am, be, I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Okay, so I want to use the name Yahweh as we go through the teaching. Everywhere you see capital L-O-R-D, the true Hebrew word there is Yahweh or Jehovah or Y. Y-H-W-H or Y-H-B-H. -H. Okay, all those are referring to the same Hebrew name. It's Yahweh. Okay, I'm going I'm to try and avoid the word Lord because there's a name here and the name is Yahweh. God says to Moses, I am Yahweh, the God of your fathers. 
and this is my name forever. And he was saying that he wants to be remembered by the name Yahweh throughout all the generations. Okay, so it seems to be really important to God that everyone know that his name is Yahweh forever. This is my name forever, and I will be remembered. Okay, if you look at a different version, the King James Version, it says, this is my memorial unto all generations. And this is really going to be one of our first clues about the identity of Yahweh. Okay, a memorial, if we look at the Hebrew word here, it's H2143, and this word, it means a memento, a recollection, a commemoration, a memorial, a memory, a remembrance, or a scent. Okay, and Yahweh is very clear that this is his name forever, and he wants to be remembered. He wants to be memorialized, commemorated um, by this name. Okay, so specifically, he's telling us, that this is a name. It's not a title. It's a name. This is my name. It's not a title. This is my name forever. I want to be remembered by this name. Okay, so he's very specific. Yahweh is his name forever, and he wants to be remembered by this. Okay, so this kind of rules out the idea that it's a title. But what's really interesting here is this deity that's speaking to Moses, he wants to be remembered, memorialized, commemorated. And this is an interesting choice of words because these are words that you use to describe someone that has passed away. You remember somebody. You you have them in your recollection. You commemorate them. You memorialize them. There's a remembrance of someone who has passed away. So it's an interesting choice of words. You don't put in to remember somebody that's still alive that you can see whenever you want to. So this is a clue that whoever's speaking this has a belief that he's going to pass away. Okay, the next thing we want to look at is Yahweh, he wants to make a name for himself. Okay, we can see in many passages that Yahweh, he wants to make a name for himself. He wants to perform powerful deeds of death and destruction so that the name Yahweh will be known throughout all the earth. Okay, he wants to be known for powerful deeds so people will worship him as God. And we're going to see as we go through the Exodus that his deeds, they are all pertaining to death and destruction and darkness. They're all pertaining to evil. And we're going to see that clearly as we go through this. And that's how he wants to be remembered. Okay, so we're still trying to prove this point whether or not Yahweh could be a title or it's a name. We already saw in the previous passage, it strongly indicated that it was a name. But we must also remember the Old Testament context concerning gods. And we know that every culture, they had different gods. There were many, many gods throughout all the populations of the earth. And so for a deity that wants to make a name for himself, it would be completely insufficient to draw worship to a title. Like, if you wanted to be worshipped, if you wanted to make a name for yourself, you couldn't pick a title like God or Lord because there were so many different gods and lords amongst all the different cultures of the earth. So if somebody was worshipping a title like uh, God or a title like Lord, you wouldn't be receiving directly the praise and worship that you're looking for. So the only way that this deity who wants to make a name for himself will get the worship he desires is he's going to have to have a specific God name to be worshipped by so that he can be differentiated from all the other deities that all these cultures have. Okay, so point number three here. So therefore, we further rule out the idea that Yahweh is a title because he specifically refers to himself as Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Okay, so Yahweh is, an, is a name and God is a title. So he wants to be known as Yahweh, which is the name, the name that he has, um, and that he is God. Okay, that's a title or a position of the Hebrews. Okay, so we see in Exodus 9.13, it says, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. 
Let my people go so that they may worship me. Otherwise, I'm going to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know there is no one like me in all the earth. By now, I could have outstretched my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I have let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known in all the earth. Okay, so Yahweh is very clear in what he's saying here. He's saying that he wants to be known to Pharaoh and all the people of Egypt and, and the Israelites. He wants to be known as the name Yahweh, who is the God of the Hebrews. So he wants to be known by the name Yahweh, which is the position or title of God of the Hebrews. And he wants to be known by these characteristics. He wants to be known as someone who could obliterate you from the earth whenever he wishes. He wants you to know that there is no one like him in all the earth because he can send mighty plagues against you and wipe you out from the earth. He's bragging about, I could have stretched my hand out and struck you and your people with the plague and just obliterated you. So he's making a big deal out of this. And, but he says, I let you live for this purpose. He wants to show off. Okay, Yahweh wants to show off. Um, he wants to show his power. His power is plagues, death, destruction. And he wants to use plagues, death, and destruction. He let these people live for the purpose to show off his power and to afflict them and afflict them again and afflict them again and afflict them again, afflict them 10 times in total during you know, during one portion of the Exodus, and then afflict them some more after uh, after the people have already left from Egypt. So he's doing this for the purpose that he wants to make a name for himself in all the earth. He wants to be known as one who brings death, destruction, plagues, sickness, disease, darkness, and all sorts of other problems. That's who Yahweh wants to be known as. Okay, reading point number five, reminder. What does a plague do? It is oppression of the devil, which kills and destroys. Jesus came to give us life. Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. He came to set us free from all oppression. He came and he bore the curse and he bore sickness for us so that we do not have to. Only Satan can send a plague because he is the one who has the power of death. God cannot kill. God doesn't even have the power of death. Satan is the one who has the power of death. We've seen that time and again in our previous studies. We know in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's Satan. We know in Acts 10.38 that Jesus went about doing good, healing all who are oppressed by the devil because God was with him. So if you have a healing need, it's because you're oppressed by the devil. Luke 4.18 says that Jesus came to set people free from oppression, not to put them into oppression with plagues. Okay, Galatians 3.13 says that Jesus redeemed us from the curse. When you go back and look at the curses, you see that they're plagues, they're diseases, they're oppressions of various kinds. Okay, so Jesus redeems us from that. He doesn't put us into that. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, we see that Jesus bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. And he took stripes on his back to set us free from the works of the devil. Hebrews 2.14 tells us that Satan has the power of death. 1 Corinthians 15.26 says that death is an enemy of God. Okay, so without a doubt, when we talk about plague, sickness, disease, death, destruction, all those things are only the workings of Satan. And, and we'll see as we go through this that all the plagues that Yahweh brings align to the character and nature and workings of Satan and not to our, our father. Okay, going on. Yahweh wants to make a name for himself. Leviticus 18.21 You are not to make any of your children pass through the fire to Molech. Do not profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. Okay, so again, this verse is telling us that Yahweh is a name. He's very specific. It's not a title. Yahweh is a name. God or Lord is a title, but Yahweh is a name. 
2 Samuel 7.23 And who is like your people Israel? God came to one nation on earth in order to redeem a people for himself, to make a name for himself, and to perform for them great and awesome acts, driving out nations and their gods before your people you redeem for yourself from Egypt. Okay, so again, he's very clear. He wants to make a name for himself. Yahweh wants to make a name for himself. He wants to do this by performing great and awesome acts. And we're going to look at all these great and awesome acts, as he calls them, which are evil acts of stealing, killing, and destroying. And even this reference to driving out nations, this is evil. This is theft. Okay, so Yahweh would lead his people in to just utterly kill every living, breathing thing in a land, and then he would take their property, they would take the women, they would even take the children, whatever they wanted, they would plunder that, which is stealing. They would kill the men, and they would kill the non-virgins, and they would save the, the virgins for themselves. Okay, that is completely ungodly. That is completely evil. Okay, so we'll see as we go through this, all the things that Yahweh is doing in this Exodus and in many other scenes in the Old Testament is stealing, killing, and destroying. And all those are the workings of Satan. Ezekiel 39, 6-7 And I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am Yahweh. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. Okay, so Yahweh is very specific. Um, first of all, he's going to use fire as a tool to kill and destroy another nation. Killing and destroying is the working of Satan. Okay, and so by killing and destroying, then they're going to know that he is Yahweh. And he calls this name Yahweh a holy name. Yahweh believes that he is the Holy One of Israel. This next page here is kind of interesting. I'm not going to make a big deal out of this, but it's an interesting side note. God says, first of all, say that my name is Haya. And then he turns around and says, um, no, say that my name is Yahweh. So first he says, my name is Haya. And then he says, my name is Yahweh. Okay, so to me, that's something fishy that's going on. Um, why would he introduce himself with two names? And give instruction to Moses twice. Go say that my name is this. Oh, moreover, go say that my name is that. That just doesn't make any sense. So let's read this. Exodus 3, 14 to 15. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Okay, so we could also put in Haya in there. And God said to Moses, Haya, Haya. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Haya has sent me to you. Then he changes his mind. Moreover, you shall say, Yahweh has sent me to you. Well, which is it? Is your name Haya or is your name Yahweh? It's two different names. Okay. Why would you say, go tell them this is my name and then say, moreover, go tell them this other thing is my name. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So um, just a consideration here. Perhaps Haya is a legitimate name of the true God. And then Satan came and said, well, moreover, tell them my name is Yahweh. And that wouldn't be the first time that God said something and then immediately Satan came and said something contradictory or different. Okay, we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God said something and then Satan comes immediately to Eve and tells her something different, which causes her to sin. Okay, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's something that's happening here. All right, let's go on. Okay, so based upon what we saw already, it's clear that Yahweh is not a title. It's a name that God wants to be remembered by, the so-called God. He wants to be remembered by this name. He wants to do plagues, um, awesome deeds, 
of death and destruction in the name Yahweh, so that the name Yahweh will be known throughout all the earth, so that that name will be worshipped. So that's who he wants to be known as. Okay, so it's definitely a name and not a title. Now what we want to do is we want to look at the Exodus and make a determination. Can we tell, is Yahweh the name of God or is it the name of Satan? So the first clue is the serpent showdown. Okay, this is the first miracle that happened when Moses and Aaron went to go meet with Pharaoh. Okay, so Yahweh's introduction was just prior to the exodus from Egypt, as we saw in, in Exodus 3.15. And Yahweh wanted to begin making a name for himself with the deliverance of Israel. And so on the surface, that sounds like a good and noble idea. However, Yahweh's methods were utterly and entirely evil. Yahweh's methods involved stealing, killing, destroying, lying, hardening of hearts, and even the slaughter of firstborns. Okay, and so when you slaughter firstborns, that's going to include babies. It's going to include children, teenagers, older firstborns, grown-up firstborns, elderly firstborns, and even animals. Okay, so these are all things that Yahweh did. So he's he's stealing, killing, and destroying. Okay. Secondly, let's remember who Satan is. Okay. The Bible tells us that Satan is also called the devil. He's also the serpent. He is also the dragon. And he is also Leviathan. So, And you can even say he's also the beast or the beast is of Satan. Okay. So all these names are associated and tied together equivalent. So if we look at Revelations 12, 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so this passage links all these names together. The dragon is the serpent, is the devil, is Satan. And we're going to tie in Leviathan now with Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Okay, so we know uh, in this instance, when it's talking about the Lord, it's talking about Jesus with uh, his sword, and his sword is the word of God. And the sword of Jesus is the word of God, and he will punish Leviathan, who is the serpent, it says Leviathan is the twisted serpent. And so we know that when it, it's linking Leviathan and the serpent together as one and the same, and we know that the serpent is Satan, is the dragon, is the devil, all those names are synonymous. Okay, so we have proven the linkage here. Leviathan, dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, they're all referring to the same being, Satan. Okay, so what we're going to see in the next passage is that this this is all a clue about the identity of the owner of the name Yahweh because this is a, a showdown, a miracle of serpents and we know that serpents are symbolic of Satan himself. We saw that in these two passages we looked at in Revelations and Isaiah. The serpent is Satan. Serpents also Leviathan. So in Exodus 7, 10 to 12, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so just as the Lord Yahweh commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Okay, so this first miracle, if you want to call it that, is um, Moses and Aaron producing a serpent by throwing down the rod. And then notice these other evil people, sorcerers and magicians. We know that those are also workings of Satan. Um, they were able to do the same thing. They threw down their rods and they also became ser serpents. Okay, so all this production of serpents, all this is from Satan. It's a working of Satan. Serpent is a symbol of Satan. Okay, and of course, in, in this case, Aaron's 
serpent swallowed up the serpents of the magicians and sorcerers. Okay, because the devil's trying to raise up this name Yahweh as God, and so of course his serpent's going to win over these other ones, which he also produced. Okay, then we see in 2 Thessalonians and also in other places, in 2 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Okay, so Satan, he does have power. He has power, he does signs, he has lying wonders. Okay, so just because there's a miraculous deed, that does not mean it is God. It, it could be Satan or it could be God. You have to look at the nature of the deed and determine what manner of spirit is that miracle. Okay, and there's many examples. We've already seen you know, several of these in past studies. But what manner of spirit is the miracle that's being done? Is it of God or is it of the devil? Okay, then our last point here. We know that Yahweh, he also did other serpent works. For example, uh, with Moses, remember when the Israelites were complaining about food and it made Yahweh angry. And so he sent snakes to go bite uh, and kill many of the Israelites and many others. They were healed uh, whenever Moses had made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Okay, that's a symbol of Satan on a pole, or you could also say it's a symbol of the curse on a pole, and it's also a type and shadow of Jesus bearing the curse on the cross. And so it's it's all those things at the same time. But again, it was a serpent on a pole that's a symbol of Satan. Okay, the first plague we're going to look at, Yahweh, his intention is to harden hearts so that he can multiply plagues. Okay, so he's not so interested in the deliverance of the people as much as he's interested in, he wants to harden Pharaoh and Egypt's hearts so that he can persist in bringing plague after plague after plague. So his heart's not in the right place. So first of all, let us remember that it is Satan, the God of this world, who hardens hearts. Or you can say blinds minds. Hardened heart and blinded mind, it's the same thing. Okay, our Father gives us a heart of flesh, yet Satan, he gives us a heart of stone. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4 And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Ezekiel 36, 26 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Okay, so we know in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world is Satan. And what does he do? He blinds minds. He hardens hearts. A blinded mind and a hardened heart, those are synonymous terms. Okay, so it is Satan, the God of this world, who hardens hearts, who blinds minds. Okay, and it tells us that our Father, that he will give us, he will take out the hardened heart. He will take out the heart of stone and he will give us a heart of flesh. Okay, so what we're showing here is our Father is not the one who hardens hearts. Okay, Yahweh, he does harden hearts and therefore he must be the God of this world or associated with the God of this world in some way. It's the agenda of Satan to harden hearts and blind minds so that he can bring death and destruction. Okay, point four here. Jesus, out of compassion, delivered people from oppression. However, Yahweh delivers with evil signs and wonders to make a name for himself. Yahweh has the evil desire to demonstrate his power with great signs and wonders that bring death and destruction. His intention in the deliverance is to repeatedly harden Pharaoh's heart so that he can show off with greater and greater evil deeds of death and destruction. And I'm just going to make a bold point here, which we will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yahweh is Satan. Okay, Yahweh, he is Satan. Remember, this whole book of Exodus, it's the introduction of Yahweh. It's when Yahweh first tells his name to Moses, and then everything that happens is Yahweh trying to establish the character and nature of the name Yahweh 
so that he'll be known throughout all the earth by the signs and wonders that he does in the name Yahweh. So everything that's happening in the book of Exodus, Exodus it's, it's showing us who Yahweh is. It reveals his character. And the Exodus reveals that Yahweh is Satan. He's the God of this world who blinds minds, who hardens hearts, who does evil signs and wonders. Exodus 4.21 And Yahweh said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I will harden his heart so that he, Pharaoh, will not let the Israelites go. Okay, so you can see um, Satan or Yahweh's intention here is not about the deliverance of the people. It's about putting on a show of death and destruction. And in order to put on the magnitude of a show that he wants to, he needs to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he can bring plague after plague after plague after plague after plague, after plague ten times, um, and you know, to to basically establish the character and to produce the fear and the awe and the wonder that he's desiring. Okay, so that's a purely evil intention. And we'll look at several of these. Exodus seven three, and I Yahweh will harden Pharaoh's heart. And multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Okay, so notice he wants to, he has stated his purpose. He is hardening Pharaoh's heart for the purpose of multiplying his evil signs and his evil wonders. Okay, and Yahweh considers a plague, a sickness, a pestilence, an insect infestation, blood in the river, um, killing firstborns. He considers those evil deeds, he calls those signs and wonders. Whereas when we look at Jesus, his signs and wonders were healing, casting out devils, raising the dead. And so you can see they're completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Yahweh's signs and wonders have to do with death and destruction. Jesus' signs and wonders have to do with bringing life and healing and deliverance. Exodus 9.12 but Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. Exodus 10, 1 to 2. Now Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. Okay, so here he's continually restating his purpose. I am hardening their hearts so I can show off with signs and wonders of death and destruction. I want to be known by the mighty evil deeds that I have done in Egypt. I want to be known by the signs I have done in the land of Egypt so that you will know who Yahweh is. So you will know who I am, Yahweh. Okay, he wants you to know him by the evil deeds that he does. Okay, again, Exodus 10, 20. Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 10, 27. Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the people go. Exodus 11, 9 to 10. But Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Okay, so again, he clearly states he's hardening Pharaoh's heart so that he can multiply his evil wonders in the land of Egypt. Exodus 14.4 I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. Exodus 14, 8. And Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with boldness. Exodus 14, 17, 18. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. 
Then the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So again, Yahweh considers gaining honor, killing all the army of Pharaoh. That's who he wants to be known as. And he purposefully hardened the hearts of the Egyptians to cause this to happen. That is utterly evil. Okay, now let's look at the first plague that Yahweh brings. The first plague is he plagues with blood, with death, and with toxic water. So Jesus' mighty work with blood was the forgiveness of sin, which brings eternal life. On the other hand, Yahweh's mighty work with blood, it was a plague of death and destruction that killed all the fish in the river. It plagued the people of Egypt with stench and it spoiled the water from drinking. Yahweh's blood act brought corruption, whereas Jesus's blood act brought cleansing, cleansing from sin. Exodus 7, 20 to 21. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as Yahweh commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Okay, so notice, Yahweh is bringing death and destruction. Death and destruction are works of Satan. It says the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Okay, so he turned the river into blood, so he corrupted the river. The river then, it brought death to all the fish. Then it brought a stench throughout all the land of Egypt, and the people couldn't drink the water. Okay, so this is purely, these are evil deeds. It's stealing, it's killing, it's destroying. Okay, let's compare that to something Jesus does. John 6, 53 to 54. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, so in the case of Jesus, when we're thinking of Jesus and we're thinking of blood, we're thinking of life. Jesus' blood, it brings life. Okay, whenever we partake of the blood of Jesus, we're partaking of his death on the cross, which freed us from sin and from the consequence of sin and gives us eternal life. Okay, so Jesus doesn't bring death, destruction, stench, or spoiling of water with his blood. He gives us eternal life with his blood. Likewise, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, so we are redeemed from Satan by the blood of Jesus. We have forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus. And all that results in us having eternal life in the presence of God. Okay, another thing to note here is that Yahweh's treatment of the enemy was a repayment of evil for evil, which is opposite of Jesus' teaching of blessing the enemy, praying for them, doing good to them, which we find in Matthew chapter 5. Okay, and, and you'll see that this is a problematic theme in this entire deliverance from Egypt. Throughout this entire deliverance, Yahweh is continually repaying evil for evil, and that's just not a concept which is of the real God. Okay, and I, God never changes, and neither does his philosophy towards enemies. That never changes either. And Jesus tells us what his position is on dealing with enemies in Matthew 5, 43 to 44. You have heard that it was said by Yahweh, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Okay, so God's position on enemies is we're to bless them. We're to do good for them. And we can look at what Jesus did to his enemies. He healed Malchus's ear. He prayed for the men who had just crucified him. Okay, so he prayed for his murderers. We can look at Stephen. Stephen was praying for the people as they were stoning him to death. He prayed for them. Okay, so those are 
exceedingly godly ways to deal with enemies, blessing the enemy, praying for the enemy, doing good to the enemy. We also saw where Elisha, when he led the army of Syria captive, he fed them, he gave them drink, and he sent them home unharmed, and they never again raided Israel. Okay, so that is a godly way of dealing with the enemy, blessing the enemy. So destroying the enemy and hardening their heart with plague after plague after plague after plague of death and destruction, that is utterly and entirely and absolutely ungodly, and it is against everything that Jesus taught. It is not of God. It is of Satan. Okay, the second plague, it was a frog plague. And he said that he wanted to make sure that people knew there is no one like Yahweh. Remember that Yahweh first introduced himself in preparation for the Exodus. His objective was to be known by the deeds that were to follow. He wanted to be known by the mighty works, signs, and wonders, as he calls them. The name that Yahweh wanted to make for himself was that there is no one like him. Because no one can do such mighty plagues as he can. He wanted people to worship him as God because of the evil signs that he would do, which were to prove that he must be God. So his idea was that he wanted to do mighty signs and wonders, even though there were evil deeds. He knew that people would think that he must be God in order to do those supernatural things. Okay, so he wanted people to worship him. Okay, but we're warned multiple times that Satan comes with power, with signs, with wonders for the purpose of deceiving us into worshiping him as God. And such was the case with Yahweh. He came with signs and wonders so that he could be known and feared as God. Exodus chapter 8, 5 to 14. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. So Yahweh did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Okay, so notice that Yahweh instructed Moses and Aaron to bring forth this curse of frogs, which would come up over all the land of Egypt. And they did. And they came into all the houses. Every place was filled with frogs. Then Moses gave the word, and the frogs, they all died. And there were just heaps, stinky heaps of dead frogs everywhere. Clearly, that's another deed of death and destruction. It's a pestilence. It's a plague. It's an evil. Now, there's an interesting thing here. The evil plague of frogs brought upon Egypt by Yahweh Satan, it's also a type of the evil frog spirits, which will be coming from dragon Satan in the book of Revelations. Revelations 16 13 to 14 and i saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to to the battle of that great day of god almighty okay so this this plague in Egypt is a type and shadow of a plague of frog demons, which are going to come at a later time, as the book of Revelations tells us. So it's not a coincidence. We know that these frog demons, well, clearly they're working of Satan. It tells us that they're from the dragon, which is Satan. It's from the beast, who is of Satan. And it's from the false prophet, who is also of Satan. And then it clearly tell, tells us that these frog spirits, they are demons. And they do signs. And so demons can do mighty signs and wonders, but they're evil signs and wonders. They're going to bring forth evil deeds like stealing, killing, and destroying. 
Now let's take a look at plagues number three and four. And here we're going to see that Yahweh oppresses with insects, with lice, and with flies. So in plagues three and four, we see that Yahweh brings oppression and corruption by bringing forth lice and flies to afflict man and beast. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus came to set us free from all oppression. Okay, so when Jesus is on the scene, he's setting people free. He's healing. He's setting free from bondage, from oppression, from demons, from sickness, from whatever bad condition. He's setting free. He's not bringing oppression. He's bringing freedom from oppression. The Bible also tells us that the children of God will set the earth free from corruption. Okay, so God is not bringing corruption and oppression to the earth, but God is all about setting free from oppression. And it, actually, it's our responsibility, the, the sons of God, it's our responsibility to set the earth free from corruption, not to bring corruption. Okay, and we know that God never changes. Therefore, the real God would never put us under oppression, but he would only set us free from it. Okay, so God, the real God, would never bring corruption and destruction and plagues of lice and flies because that's evil. God doesn't change. He only brings freedom from corruption, freedom from oppression. He doesn't put us under it. Okay, now what's really interesting, there's also a demonic name in the Bible. It's called Beelzebub. And Beelzebub, it means, when you translate it, it's Lord of the Fly. Okay, so this is yet another linkage to the workings of Satan. Okay, then there's some related terms in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you'll see that there is Beelzebub and Beelzebul are names that are mentioned. And interestingly, when you look at the name Beelzebul, okay, this is a name, it's a name of Satan. It refers to the prince of evil spirits. And the literal translation of it is dung god okay well what do you find on a pile of dung you find maggots and you find flies so this is not coincidence beelzebub refers to lord of the fly which is a working of satan you know we we have a fly plague on our hands here okay and then we have beelzebul and beelzebub in the new testament which is the dung god and on a pile of dung <laughs> there are maggots and flies and this is not a coincidence this is an exact linkage to Satan. Okay, in Exodus 8, 17 and 24. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, Thus says Yahweh, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen and which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am Yahweh in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And Yahweh did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, and to his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. Okay, so, so we can clearly see that these flies and lies, they are an oppression, an affliction, a plague Okay, that Yahweh has brought so that they will know who he is. He wants to be known as somebody who afflicts and oppresses in order that you may know that I am Yahweh. I'm doing this evil thing to you so you know that I am Yahweh. Okay, he wants people to know him for his acts of corruption, oppression, affliction. But when we look at the real God, we look at Jesus. Luke 4.18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because 
He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Everything Jesus is doing here is about bringing freedom and blessing to people. Now he wants to preach the gospel to the poor who most need it. He wants to bring healing to those who have broken hearts. He wants to set people free from any kind of captivity, but from a pure heart, not to make a show of things. He wants to bring physical healing to those who have need of it. And he wants to set people free who are oppressed. So he wants to undo the things that Yahweh is described as doing. Okay, so you can see that Jesus and Yahweh are in exact opposition to one another. There's, there's no relation here. They're exactly opposite. Yahweh is Satan. Okay, Yahweh is a name that he's operating as God um, that he wants to be worshipped by. And we'll look at more of that later on. Okay, but notice also in Romans 8, 20 and 21, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay, so what we see in this passage is that not only is Jesus one who sets free from oppression, but also the children of God, which is me and you, that we also are going to set, set creation free from the bondage of corruption. Okay, so we can see then clearly the will of God is freedom from oppression, freedom from corruption. Okay, it is not oppressing with lice and flies. It is not bringing corruption with a swarm of flies, but God's will is freedom from oppression and freedom from corruption. So it is very plain to see that the will of Yahweh and the deeds of Yahweh are exactly opposite of the will and the deeds of Jesus, our Father, and the Holy Spirit, and even the deeds of the children of God, because we will set the earth free from corruption. We do not corrupt the land. Okay, so these are exactly opposite works. All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. So this will be part one of our teaching about whose name is Yahweh. We're going to continue with the rest of the plagues in our next session, and then we'll have some additional sessions after that, at least one after that, maybe more. Okay, the first point, Exodus 3.15 and several other passages that we looked at prove that Yahweh is not a title, but it is in fact a name that this so-called God wants to be known by and remembered by. And he specifically said he wanted to make a name for himself. And so Yahweh is not a title, but it is definitely a name. And that means that it will belong to one or the other. It either belongs to Satan or it belongs to our Father, but it's not a name for both. It's one or the other. Okay, so then point number two, Yahweh clearly stated that his purpose was to do mighty signs, wonders, and plagues, plagues, so that all the earth would know there is no one like him. He wanted to be known for what he called awesome deeds, and those deeds, they involved death, destruction, stealing, killing, destroying. Okay, the deeds he wanted to be known by were evil and are the workings of Satan. Okay, point number three. The serpent miracle showdown, which started the conversation between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh, it's the first clue that reveals Yahweh is in fact Satan, who is also known as the serpent. Okay, so Satan has many different names that we saw earlier. Satan, devil, serpent, dragon, Leviathan, and even the beast and the false prophet are are associated with Satan. So there's many different names that are associated with Satan. Serpent is one of them. So our father would not choose to do a serpent miracle. He could choose something else. In fact, whenever Jesus did miracles, he did life-giving miracles. Number four, Yahweh clearly stated that he was going to harden the heart of Pharaoh so that he could multiply his evil signs and wonders to show off his power and to make a name for himself. Okay, so that's evil. He wants to harden Pharaoh's heart 
so he can bring plague after plague after plague after plague to show off his power and to make a name. Okay, and all the deeds that he did, they were evil deeds. Okay, and it's easy to see that. It's not a stretch by any means. And we know from the New Testament that Satan is the god of this world, and we also see that Satan is the one who hardens hearts and blinds minds. Okay, so it's not God our Father, it's not Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. You know, they, in fact, lead us into all truth. They lead us out of sin. They give us a heart of flesh um, to replace the heart of stone. Okay, so when they're doing a work on our heart, it's not to harden it, but it's to make it soft, it's to make it believing, it's to make it faithful. Number five, Yahweh Satan, his first plague in Egypt, he turns the river to blood, he kills the fish, he creates a stench, and he spoils the water from drinking. All of that, that's stealing, it's killing, and destroying. And we know from Jesus that is the working of the thief, which is Satan. Okay, Jesus, on the other hand, his great act of blood was that he produced forgiveness of sins and he brought us eternal life with his blood act, if you want to call it that. Satan's blood act, Yahweh's blood act, it, it spoiled things, it ruined, it brought death and destruction, whereas on the other hand, Jesus brings life with his blood. Point number six, Yahweh brings more destruction with the frog plague. Okay, so there was destruction, there was ruin, there was stench, there was heaps of frogs everywhere. That's an oppression, it's a destruction, and there's also death involved in that. Okay, but it's also a type and a shadow of an event the book of Revelations tells about tells us about, which is where these demon frog spirits will come from the dragon, from the beast, and from the false prophet. This is going to take place in a future time, and it says that these demon frog spirits are going to do signs. So again, that's another link to the workings of Satan, who is the dragon, who has the beast and the false prophet are from him also. Number seven, plagues three and four. Okay, these are the oppressions with lice and flies. Okay, and we know that Satan is the oppressor, whereas God brings freedom from oppression. Additionally, there are multiple references in the Bible to uh, demon gods. For example, in the Old Testament, there's Beelzebub, and Beelzebub, translated to English, is Lord of the Fly. In the New Testament, we see Beelzebul, and Beelzebul is a reference to Satan, um, you know, the prince, one of the princes of darkness. Also, it means Lord of Dung. And we talked about this on a pile of dung. There is also maggots and flies. Okay, so there are two links of demon, demon god names that are also associated with, with flies. Okay, so you can see that not only as lice and flies, it is an oppression, it is an affliction, it is a destruction, it is a corruption, and Jesus brings freedom from all that, but also there happen to be demon gods that are associated with flies. Okay, so this is not an accident, it's not a coincidence, it's just another proof point of the identity. Okay, and the conclusion, even at this early point in the study, we can conclude that Yahweh's deeds are utterly evil and they are workings of Satan and this is the identity that he wants to be known by he wants to be Yahweh wants to be known by evil deeds of death destruction stealing killing destroying and though that is the identity of Satan and that tells us Yahweh is Satan and we're gonna see many 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 more proof points of this as we continue but we have to remember that Yahweh introduced himself for the purpose of creating a name, and he did this right before the Exodus. So Exodus tells us who Yahweh is. So we need to pay close attention to this. All right, well, that's all for today. So God bless you, and we will talk again very soon.